Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Tehami. The U.S. State Department says that it is confident on Pakistan's commitment and ability to secure nuclear assets. And it came after a meeting between Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, Mr. Masood Khan, and the counselor, Mr. Derek Sholay, who is a policy advisor to the Secretary of State, Mr. Anthony Blinken. And uh, Mr. Sholay, in his tweet after the meeting, said uh, that uh, they discussed a number of issues and both the countries can cooperate in future in a number of areas. And Ambassador Masood Khan also, in a tweet, said they discussed ways to build further resilience in Pakistan-U.S. relations to boost strategic uh, trust between the two countries. There was another development. A 252nd Corps Commander Conference was held with Chief of Army Staff General Kamar Javed Bajwa in the chair. According to ISPR, the forum reposed full confidence in the security and the structure and the safety arrangements which have been made by Pakistan uh, regarding uh, the nuclear assets and the strategic assets. Earlier, uh, we saw Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif also said that Pakistan uh, takes uh, the security and the safety of its nuclear assets with utmost seriousness. Uh, Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari also said that Pakistan meets all the international standards as far as the safety and the security of the nuclear assets is uh, concerned. Now, these statements and this response came in the wake of the remarks which were made by U.S. President Joe Biden uh, regarding Pakistan, uh, saying that it is one of the most dangerous nations in the world with nuclear weapons without cohesion. A strong demarche was later on conveyed to the U.S. ambassador uh, to uh, Pakistan, Mr. Donald Bloom. Now, at the same time, there is a, a report by the Nuclear Threat Index, which has improved Pakistan's ranking, uh, uh, saying that it is one of the most improved country on safety and security of its uh, nuclear assets. And surprisingly, it has placed Pakistan uh, far ahead of India. So there are a lot of aspects regarding uh, this particular statement by uh, U.S. President Mr. Joe Biden uh, regarding the safety and the security of Pakistan's nuclear assets. And to discuss various aspects of this, we'll be joined by an esteemed panel of guests. But before that, our production team has prepared a report. Let's watch that. Pakistan's apt and assertive response to the Biden's statement on Pakistan's nuclear weapons, declaring it one of the most dangerous nations in the world, proved fruitful. As recently, a State Department spokesperson said that the United States is confident of Pakistan's commitment and its ability to secure nuclear assets. The statement came shortly after a meeting on Monday between Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, Masood Khan, and the State Department counselor, Derek Sholay, who serves as a senior policy advisor to the United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. In another statement, State Department's deputy spokesperson, Vedant Patel, said... While responding to a question at the Daily News briefing that the United States has always viewed a secure and prosperous Pakistan as critical to United States' interest. The spokesperson recalled the recent high-level visits on both sides, including the trip to the United States by Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari. President Biden's remarks about Pakistan nuclear program were strongly rebuked by Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif and declared the statement as factually incorrect and misleading. On the other hand, the Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari also strongly rejected Biden's statement and said that as far as safety and security of Pakistan's nuclear assets are concerned, Pakistan has always fulfilled all standards of the International Atomic Energy Agency. You just watched that report. Let's jump straight away into the discussion. We are honored and privileged to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Nasir Ali Khan, who is the former ambassador. Mr. Khan, thank you very much for your time at Views on News today. We really appreciate that. And we are also privileged and honored to have been joined in the studio by Dr. Rifat Hussain, who is the strategic analyst. Uh, Dr. Rifat Hussain, thank you very much for your time also at Views on News. My, really my, my pleasure. And we are also privileged and honored to have been joined on Skype from Washington by Air Vice Marshal Retired Ijaz Malik, Senior Analyst. Air Vice Marshal Ijaz Malik, uh, thank you very much for your time also at Views on News. We really appreciate that. So uh, let's begin the discussion uh, with you, Mr. Khan. Now, uh, this particular statement, uh, it um, garnered huge response from Pakistani authorities. Uh, the statement which was made by U.S. President Joe Biden. 
and a strong dimash was also conveyed to the U.S. authorities. Now, there are uh, different sort of statements coming from the U.S. State Department a spokesperson as well, and there has been a meeting between Mr. Masood Khan as well as Mr. Derek Sholay. Uh, do you think it was because of the strong reaction by Pakistani authorities and a strong dimash which was conveyed to the U.S. authorities? Well, personally, I think both the meeting between uh, Mr. Ambassador Masood Khan and uh, Mr. Derek Sholay uh, as well as the statement given by Mr. Vedant Patel, is, is essentially a sort of firefighting after this episode. Now, we go back to this uh, fundraiser where President Biden made this statement. Uh, initially, it was quite baffling. You know, it comes out of nowhere. Uh, and, and in the not too recent past, uh, the impression that our government has also been given is that uh, relations have certainly improved and there have been several trips. Mr. Derek Sholay himself was here uh, recently and of course our foreign minister, our, our prime minister and uh, secretary, uh, foreign secretary have all been engaging with the Americans in the United States. So um, it was a little baffling. But then you know um, there are two factors as far as Joe Biden's uh, statement is concerned. One is that, you see, Mr. Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, uh, considers himself uh, a very senior and experienced foreign policy expert because he spent a long time as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Right. And, and people who are in senior positions now at the State Department uh, are very junior to him. So he, he can often make statements without consulting the State Department. He considers it his prerogative. Uh, now, the State Department, as you can well see, seems to have a different view and wants to uh, save uh, the situation and, and is making efforts to do that. Uh, the other thing, of course, is, is the fact that these midterm elections that are upon uh, the US uh, Congress uh, these also play a very important role in what the president says. Because uh, very often uh, you find statements like, if you remember the case of Mr. Donald Trump, who said that you know Mexicans are criminals or rapists and things like that, it really shocked people. But at the end of the day, you discover that he is really pandering or he is really saying this to appease or to attract certain voters. Right. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Nasir, uh, Nasir Khan, there are two very important points and very interestingly, the second point I would like you to elaborate that, uh, that one a little in detail. Yes. Uh, because as you already mentioned, Mr. Donald Trump had been trying to take mileage by uh, passing out such remarks against certain nations also. So, uh, does it depict that there is a kind of a negative sentiment across America vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan? If uh, if he's losing the battle for the midterm elections, he has to pass some rec uh, remarks straight away uh, towards the country where you are having a little bit of thaw uh, the most recently in the relationship. No, no not across America. The general public uh, is, is not too concerned with foreign policy. But you have to look at the actual event where he was saying this. This was an event of very few high net worth individuals who were getting together in an event. Uh, there is a lady called Marcy Carsey, who is a producer of popular television shows uh, like uh, Roseanne Barr's show and uh, Bing Crosby's show. And she is an old supporter of the Democratic Party. And to date, she has, uh, even in this instance, donated about $200,000 to the Democratic Party's campaign. Now, she is having a fundraiser where you are paying $5,000 per head, $10,000 a couple to attend an exclusive event of 100 people uh, to meet and greet uh, President uh, Joe Biden. Now, it is being held in California. So there are two possibilities. One, the connection with Hollywood, and maybe there are powerful Jewish lobbies there that you are very concerned with Pakistan's nuclear program, right. then you can see the connection right. between this nuclear thing. The other, of course, California has a very powerful Indian lobby also. Right. You know, in Silicon Valley, most of the top executives 
uh, they are Indian. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Indian diaspora in the United States is very united right. and spends a lot of money on election campaigns. Right. So, you know, initially I find this baffling, but then when you look deeper into it, there is a possibility that this was said in the context of the coming midterm elections. Right. Uh, Dr. Rifat Hussain, your take regarding President Joe Biden's uh, recent statement, uh, it was met with a very prompt and a swift and a very strong response from Pakistani authorities. As Mr. Nasir Ali Khan has mentioned, two very important connections to this particular statement happen in California with proximity to Hollywood and also uh, with proximity uh, to the Indian lobby over there. Since we saw uh, a thaw in the relationship between Pakistan and the U.S. and high-level engagements back and forth. Uh, so do you think, and th then there was a little bit of resentment, not a little bit of resentment, a resentment, but a huge resentment when the Indians saw Pakistan and U.S. engaging at that level. Do you think Indian lobby had worked it out to put such type of words in uh, U.S. president's mouth? Well, uh, I think that's a matter for debate to what extent the Indian lobby actually exercised their influence and put uh, uh, its agenda in the mouth of the U.S. president. But the fact remains that there was a domestic context in which this statement was made. And the very fact that it was made at a fundraiser uh, surely indicates that the Indian influence must have been very, very strong. But on the other hand, looking at this whole episode from Pakistan's perspective, it's very important that what he said, which means that the linking Pakistan nuclear program or its uh, presumed dangers uh, to Pakistan's uh, lack of uh, political cohesion, which in fact is something that the current polarization within Pakistan between PTI and the PDM, uh, that's the, uh, the party in power, has been uh, uh, highlighted so many times. Imran Khan himself has said that, you know, th these are the people who have looted the wealth of this nation and they cannot be trusted with Pakistan national security. So these kind of, uh, this kind of polarization uh, must have contributed uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, these uh, statements by uh, President Biden himself. But the fact remains, regardless of how polarized Pakistan is, how ideologically divisive our uh, political atmosphere is, how divisive our political discourse is, the fact remains that, you know, if you look at the uh, track record, uh, there is a not an iota of doubt in anybody's mind that Pakistan's nuclear weapons are unsafe or they pose a danger to any other country. In fact, Pakistan's uh, the whole defensive posture is based on the threat from India. And, you know, we uh, pursue this option, even though we haven't declared uh, our doctrine yet. But, you know, everybody knows that, you know, Pakistan nuclear weapons are not weapons of aggression. These are weapons of defense. And, you know, the world is better off looking at it from this perspective. Right. Uh, Dr. Rafat Hussain, you mentioned a very important point that it could have been because of the uh, uh, political polarization over here in our society. So the political polarization is not exclusive to Pakistani politics only. Uh, there had been um, uh, extreme divisions when it came to the U.S. presidential election as well. And the yeah. kind of narrative uh, former president, uh, Mr. Donald Trump, also uh, spread across uh, the U.S. Now, uh, when it comes to the political polarization of a certain country, does it matter that uh, a, a, a leader of a that stature as of a U.S. president could make such remarks on the basis of the internal political divisions of a country? Well, Jawad, you have to see that uh, there has been a strain of opposition to Pakistan nuclear weapons program amongst the policy-making community, and that strain still exists. So given that, uh, that element of opposition. I'm not saying that there's a opposition across the board, but there, is, there are people, there are elements, there are lobbies who are opposed to Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. And these lobbies have been looking at what's happening inside Pakistan, and they are drawing their sustenance from these kind of polarization that They're we are talking about. They're always in a hunt of any sort of opportunity yeah, that yeah, they, absolutely. they can grab. And, but the most important thing is that the United States should be the last country to lecture about uh, other countries about 
political viability or lack of political cohesion when its own Congress was attacked by exactly. the by the right wingers on the lives were uh, also uh, lost uh, on the Capitol Hill. So let's go to Air Vice Marshal retired Jaz Malik, uh, Mr. Malik. Uh, why so much skepticism when it comes to um, the U.S. president regarding the safety and the security of the nuclear arsenal in Pakistan? Uh, let's uh, just see the context in which uh, this entire, you know, uh, state, uh, statement or comments were given. Uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, asking, uh, asked by someone and then responding to a few questions, uh, the President uh, Biden was highlighting the, you know, uh, uh, imminent or uh, prevalent threats uh, to in the global uh, uh, you know, context. And uh, in that, he was highlighting Russia, China, and then straight away coming to Pakistan. So that uh, statement, uh, I mean, if that is indicative of anything, it is the, you know, uh, the, the thought process or the thinking of the White House. And uh, if you see the statement which immediately uh, was given by the White House, a representative, uh, it was that uh, I don't have to offer any comments because it is nothing new what President Biden has said. But fortunately, uh, the State Department, they tried to uh, do some, uh, uh, you know, damage control and uh, they issued the statement, which was uh, obviously uh, an effort to diffuse uh, the situation because uh, there was a huge response from uh, Pakistan side. Uh, 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 Washington Post has carried a story uh, just day before and in which it is highlighted that uh, in Pakistan there was a very strong response from the uh, 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 Prime Minister and then two former Prime Ministers and one former President. And all of these uh, uh, gentlemen belonging to uh, different uh, uh, political parties uh, and uh, having a very uh, uh, opposing uh, domestic agendas, but still they all were unanimously, you know, they all condemned this statement and they right. all, you know, reflected that Pakistan's command and control system is robust, it is, uh, you know, uh, time-tested and uh, uh, there is nothing we should be a matter of concern to any international body looking after uh, the nuclear uh, uh, developments uh, globally or for the United States. And particularly right. the time, and now you see the, uh, uh, recently, uh, presumably, uh, Pakistan relationship with the Biden administration, they were, you know, on a uh, improvement, uh, uh, would say, uh, uh, side. Mr. Uh, Mr. Malik, uh, beg your pardon for the interje uh, interjection. I'll come to this very specific point. I'll take your view on this one as well. Uh, as you mentioned, there was a little bit of difference between the statements. Uh, the earlier statement, which was uh, immediately, uh, 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 to be exact, one day after the remarks made by U.S. President came from the White House press secretary that went uh, on to say the President was saying nothing new. As you already mentioned, the President views a secured and prosperous Pakistan as critical to U.S. interests. Now, the statement which has come from the State Department, uh, you, you are of the view it is different from the statement that was given by the White House Press Secretary. Uh, to be exactly, it quotes, uh, the United States is confident of Pakistan's commitment and its ability to secure nuclear assets. That makes it quite different. But uh, if we go deeper down into the statement, uh, it again reiterates the very stance which was given by White House Press Secretary. And now this statement by the State Department says that the U.S. has always viewed secure and prosperous Pakistan as critical to the U.S. interests. It's again the repetition of the same statement which was uh, given by White House Press Secretary. So when we uh, analyze both of these statements, the word which has been used as a secure Pakistan, what does that imply to be exactly? Yes, uh, uh, this is, a, th that is actually the a point of concern for us, that what uh, bothers them about security of Pakistan. 
uh, if at all, uh, uh, the security of Pakistan, then they have never, uh, you know, uh, acknowledged our, uh, you know, submissions or our uh, uh, concerns about uh, our arch rival India, uh, which, uh, you know, is always a looming threat for Pakistan security. Uh, the the uh, the militant groups which are being uh, you know uh, funded and sponsored by the ex uh, external uh, uh, elements uh, they have never specifically raised any concern over that uh, so uh, just very vaguely uh, giving a statement that it lacks cohesion uh, i think uh, uh, it's at least to say this is a very uh, 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 unwarranted uh, statement given the timings and the context. Right, right. So uh, let's um, uh, uh, take uh, Mr. Khan's view on this. Now, um, as uh, you all have already mentioned, there was a sort of a thaw in the relationship between Pakistan and the U.S. at that very critical time when the U.S. president has himself made a pledge to help Pakistan out with mitigating the impacts of the climate-induced uh, devastating floods recently Pakistan has been hit with. Now, uh, do you think it could have been counterproductive to all those high-level engagements between Pakistani authorities and the U.S. by um, releasing such or saying such of statements? Well, there are two things. You see, in, in light of these recent floods, the whole world is concerned about climate change and the focus now uh, because of the floods in, in Pakistan. And they all realize the fact that this is a global problem. It, it is not limited to any borders or boundaries. So uh, th this is one aspect of it. The other thing, of course, is security, which is, uh, frankly, the fact that there is instability and uncertainty in Pakistan. If you were looking at another country and, and, and the central government was limited to like 30 kilometers and it was surrounded by another party, as we were talking about polarization, hostile to each other, and then these threats of people marching on, you know, coming with these marches and things but, uh, like but that. Uh, but Mr. Nasili Khan, the hostility doesn't seem to be of that scale and proportion as we see in the eastern neighboring country. And not only that, the ultra-nationalism, which has been alluded by Pakistani authorities a number of times, and they've tried to sensitize the international community regarding uh, the kind of ultra-nationalism and the kind of extremist activities going on and the kind of discrimination towards minorities, which is underway over there Absolutely. in India. And not only that, they practic uh, practically proved that they can't hold the nuclear arsenals or the missiles in the control. So they misfired a so-called uh, a supersonic uh, object that uh, fell into Pakistani territory. Why doesn't the U.S. talk about it? Uh, then we saw a delayed response by the U.S. State Department after six good days after their so-called misfire. No, no, that's, that's very obvious. That's very clear. Why doesn't the U.S. talk about uh, you know, the problems in Gaza. Uh, why doesn't the U.S. talk about Kashmir and the human rights violations over there? You're absolutely right. There's a level of hypocrisy there. But, you know, they are talking about their own interests here. And, and that also, if, if you'll allow me, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, their strategy of having India as a strategic partner. My own assessment is that India is leading the United States up the garden path. Because uh, first of all, to look at the Chinese uh, relations, their uh, trade with China is $127.5 billion. They are not going to jeopardize that because they are now partners with the United States. Despite the issue they had on the LAC, their trade was a record high at that point. The other aspect is their defense and security uh, needs. You see more than 70% of their defense uh, armament, their equipment, all comes from Russia. And even the joint ventures that they have for local production is, is Russian. So if you expect somebody to be your military partner, it will take decades for them to shift, if at all, if they ever do. So the war in Ukraine right now has brought all this to the front, right? Because they expected a certain sort of conduct uh, from India. 
and they were very disappointed. But Mr. And Nasser Ali Khan, apparently the U.S. didn't seem to be very much pleased with the kind of stance India had regarding the Russia and Ukraine exactly. conflict. It also abstained from the resolution in the General Assembly. That's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. I mean, they, so, uh, they were expecting India as their so-called recent partner to right. support them as far as That's the Ukraine conflict. That's why they kept silent on the so-called misfire. Because they rely Sudan. so much on their defense armament as well as the fact that they have an opportunity to have uh, cheaper oil in, in these conditions. The, the sec Foreign Secretary of India has clearly stated that, you know, we are in great distress because of the rising oil prices. So to have an opportunity to get something at 30 percent discount, uh, they went for it. But it is slowly exposing India and, and their interests and the fact that you know, they are taking U.S. along in this so-called change of policy, you see. Uh, another very important thing is, if the U.S. intends uh, to supplant, uh, you know, their Chinese investments, you know, change over to investing in India, large investments, I don't believe that as long as there is a threat of conflict between India and Pakistan, that any serious investor will come and invest billions of dollars in India. So. From that point of view, I think the U.S., if that is their interest, ought to try and solve the issues that there are between India and Pakistan. Right. Dr. Rifat uh, uh, your take regarding uh, U.S. silence when India um, uh, misfires a supersonic object and that lands into Pakistani territory, and we saw a delayed and a very slow uh, response from the U.S. authorities, uh, six good days. What was the reason as... Um, uh, what reasons do you view regarding that well, delayed response? Uh, initially, the Americans uh, accepted the Indian explanation that it was a technical mistake. But later on, uh, we find out that the Indian Air Force uh, uh, conducted its own inquiry, which led to the sacking of two high-ranking officials. Uh, and they is that uh, uh, sufficient no 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 but what I'm trying to lay out the facts that you know at the time nobody knew what had actually happened so the Americans have a, a tendency to react to what they know but that limited knowledge was later on expanded when the full-fledged inquiry was held and uh, Pakistan had offered it itself to be become part of the joint investigation to which India obviously didn't agree but then in, in retrospect, we know that you know it was a lot more serious than than the uh, initial description of it being a technical accident. So, and I have yet to s see Americans uh, coming up very clearly and admonishing India that you know this these kinds of uh, supersonic missile and you know when you have it travel into the Pakistani territory for 40 kilometers and you know it lands up near Narawal it could have uh, if our air force would not have been tracking this missile the movement of this missile it could have god forbid you know led to not only a civil aviation disaster but it could have led catastrophic consequences so that's that's a very instructive example of the US ignoring you know these uh, India's uh, 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 accidental launches uh, and which is uh, which does not behoove it and the other factor which I think is very important when we talk about the Indo-US partnership is that you have to understand Javad that the 70 percent of the American investments are by the American corporate sector so that corporate sector is heavily involved in what is going on inside India if you look at the uh, the top um, uh, executives of the CEOs of these uh, uh, these firms, uh, these multinational f uh, firms, which are American firms, and you know those are headed by by the former uh, U.S. government uh, employees or the uh, people who are involved Sir, in the corporate sector. Do you think India is completely stable when it comes to uh, no, no polarization no, over no, there no, as no, well? No. The rise of Hindutva, the discrimination against by all the no minorities means. over I'm not, there, I'm not and saying. the usurpation of the rights of the Kashmiris and an illegal I'm, and I'm not saying. I think of all the criticism that Pakistan is making and has been making of the Indian repressive policies vis-a-vis -vis the minorities. So uh, how can uh, uh, the corporate Kashmir. sector come and install itself in a country which is already having the um, 
rise of Hindutva extremist ideology, the flag bearer of which is RSS, and uh, they've got their elements in the Bhatia Janata Party, which is led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who was uh, dubbed as a butcher of Gujarat, and he was also banned from the world travel uh, till he became the Prime Minister of the country. Well, before he became the Prime Minister of the country, uh, Modi was, uh, was ostracized from entering the uh, US political uh, territory, but then everything changed. Because in, in Modi's rise, uh, led by Hinditva in, in ideology, uh, American corporate sectors and American strategic interests were well served by them because they were trying to prop up India as a counterpoint to China. Right. So that competition e even today exists. And if you look at the Indo-US Pacific strategy, in, in which you know, Pakistan is not mentioned, but India is clearly mentioned as the as the lead partner of the United States. So this is the this is a geopolitical game that the Americans are playing vis-a-vis -vis India, much to its own detriment, I, I should say, because Pakistan has been the ally of the United States for such a long period of time, and you know we have been we have made so many sacrifices to uh, help United States. Uh, 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 cut its losses from Afghanistan and you know we are still a, um, a partner of the United States in the global war on terror which is now uh, a different name is being used but uh, the, these are these are issues which need to be highlighted by uh, through our discourse and we should and the we should sensitize the American public opinion uh, 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 th through uh, these campaigns uh, and you know and Pakistan has been the most sanctioned ally of the United States that's a that's a unique distinction that Pakistan has enjoyed and especially during the war on terror when you're yeah, calling yeah. it yeah. a non NATO ally yeah and, so that happens and, to be surprising and, and I was very surprised to see Donald uh, Trump when he was the president uh, you know uh, uh, in January 2017 I believe he said that you know we are not going to give a penny to Pakistan as a coalition fund Let partner. Let's offer mediation between Pakistan and India. Let's, uh, uh, I'll come back to you with some other points to be discussed. Let's go to Mr. Uh, Ijaz Malik. Now, uh, ahead is a scenario. If there uh, was a, a so-called misfire by India that landed in Pakistan territory, and uh, that uh, could have resulted in any kind of tragedy or a big loss, so had this uh, scenario been in the vice versa, so what sort of reaction do you think could have been, especially from the West, um, uh, in general and in particular from the U.S.? Uh, yes, uh, as it has been highlighted uh, by, uh, by our worthy panelists, uh, they have always been biases because in uh, Washington, uh, the policy makers and the opinion uh, makers uh, they have uh, a huge influence and penetration by the Indian diaspora uh, in United States. Uh, so uh, they uh, help shape up the narratives uh, in which, you know, uh, 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 the perception management is done in a manner where, you know, Pakistan, as just highlighted by Dr. Uh, Hussain uh, very aptly, that Pakistan having, you know, contributed so much the only country which has highest number of casualties uh, in the U.S.-led war on terror in Afghanistan, uh, you know, uh, still uh, we were always, you know, uh, branded or we were always, you know, uh, projected as if we are part of the problem and we were uh, not the uh, part of the solution. Remember, uh, you know, we had, you, uh, there was a term coined as FPAC, and then we ended up, you know, uh, showing our concern over that, and they ultimately had to, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, do away with that. And at that time, the uh, under secretary in uh, the State Department, she was an Indian uh, uh, origin uh, uh, American. So uh, that is the kind of influence that they exercise. Uh, and I think they're taking advantage of your, uh, uh, you know, uh, viewership uh, internationally, I would like to just recap that uh, we have a very robust command and control system. Uh, the National uh, Command Authority was established 
uh, uh, after uh, the uh, detonations and uh, uh, this is the uh, apex body uh, which is uh, surely uh, uh, the you know civilian led uh, the prime minister shares it and it has all the stakeholders uh, uh, all the relevant stakeholders from uh, uh, various uh, uh, de government departments and it has a, a representation of the entire uh, you know uh, our decision making uh, uh, players and uh, it controls uh, uh, the uh, all the elements uh, be it or research and development exercises deployment or uh, operational command and control and uh, okay. just uh, uh, about your question uh, the pakistan exercised uh, i think great restraint uh, in the, while it had uh, you know the tra tracking uh, ability uh, uh, of the uh, indian um, uh, missile uh, which landed in pakistan but imagine uh, if we were not having that robust com and, uh, command and control we could have reacted because uh, uh, an in flight missile system missile being tracked does not give any identification or does not give uh, any sort of uh, uh, you know assistance uh, to the trackers or to the air defense system of pakistan uh, with which we can be sure that this is not a, a nuclear tipped uh, uh, missile so uh, uh, we didn't react uh, it just reflects right. that uh, while we had the option and we were tracking we were uh, in fact very timely Pakistan exactly uh, uh, ex exactly exhibited the maximum restraint that is what exactly has been reiterated by the co commander conference uh, today as well uh, um, i would like to quote uh, the statement of ispr over here mr malik uh, it uh, says as a responsible nuclear weapon state pakistan has taken all the measures necessary to strengthen its nuclear security regime at par with the international best practices a uh, forum was also informed that pakistan has a robust command and control structure and the security arrangements related to country strategic and this is not only coming from the pakistani authorities uh, it has been also said by nuclear threat initiative and uh, it has improved pakistan's ranking far ahead of india and uh, there was an increase of 25 points in pakistan's rankings which is the second largest improvement of any country since the index was first launched back in 2012 when these facts and figures are right available why do you think uh, the us authorities uh, authorities didn't uh, take some time to look into these uh, facts also to corroborate with the ground reality that pakistan has a robust control and command system well they were always oblivious of the you know uh, ground realities i would say uh, their response or their comments about various uh, uh, development in the subcontinent uh, would be seen uh, uh, and and predominantly dictated uh, you know by the indian concerns they always see while they you know keep telling us that uh, you should not see uh, uh, pak us relation uh, from a uh, prism of uh, uh, us uh, india relations but uh, conversely speaking whenever they are talking about pakistan uh, or whatever uh, whenever they have to you know uh, play their role uh, 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 pakistan and, uh, in pakistan and india in any context of uh, you know of strategic importance uh, they always they always filter uh, uh, their opinions they always very you know cautious comment and uh, uh, they never use any strong words even uh, if the entire world is standing beside pakistan so that reflects the incoming back to the same point that uh, uh, what kind of influence the indian lobbies they create Right, uh, Mr. Malik, your point is well taken. Mr. Khan, what's your view regarding these facts which have been given by the Nuclear Threat Initiative? Um, uh, the report goes on to say that uh, it was because of the improved uh, regulations in Pakistan, and uh, the ranking has uh, improved uh, for 25 points. That is the second largest improvement of any country regarding the safety and the security of the nuclear arsenal. Yes, absolutely, and and it's not just the Nuclear Threat Initiative. There are so many agencies globally. that keep an eye on nuclear assets 
nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons movements and their security, and not one of them have ever pointed out any element of concern that they have about our nuclear program. The other thing that you have to note is that our nuclear program, as was mentioned earlier, is, is clearly for defensive purposes. From the mid-70s when um, India uh, had their first detonation and we decided that we were compelled uh, to have uh, a nuclear weapon uh, a, a, as, a, as a response to India's uh, explosion, uh, to the late 90s when they finally uh, announced that they had a weapon. Uh, it has always been a reaction. And then in light of what happened in 1971 and the fact that their conventional forces are far greater than ours, obviously uh, we have certain concerns and that is how this nuclear deterrent uh, of Pakistan came about. But having said that, we have by any estimate less than about 200 nuclear weapons, and they are all contained within the boundaries of Pakistan. As opposed to that, if you look at the United States, it has 750 bases spread over 80 countries. Today, it has more than 3,750 nuclear warheads, which is uh, the minimum. Uh, in the 60s, they used to have more than 30,000 nuclear warheads. And if you look at the history of accidents that they have had, they are sometimes absolutely laughable if they weren't of such mm. great concern. Mm. I can give you at least seven examples where, you know, in one instance, there was a 40 megaton accident of several bombs that had to fall into a swamp because the aircraft carrying them uh, had, had a technical problem. Uh, they have had problems where bombs have fallen into rivers and they have not been recovered. Uh, as far as their civil side is concerned, there have been more than 56 accidents in nuclear power plants. If you remember, the Three Mile Island mm. uh, was a <coughs> major one. But apart from that, the minor <coughs> ones. So what I'm trying to say is if your weapons are greater in number and they're spread out over 80 countries and 750 bases, imagine uh, what level uh, of uh, safety. So the question of co uh, lack of cohesion uh, arises over there very <laughs> Yes, if you look at the military cohesion, yeah. yes. I mean, the, apart from <laughs> the political one. Right, uh, Dr. Rifat Hussain. Now, Nuclear Threat Initiative has improved Pakistan's ranking. The figures are very much available, yet such, uh, such type of statements coming uh, from the top office of the U.S. Well, uh, I would attribute it to uh, not only ignorance, but the uh, but the um, lack of attention to detail, but other countries or other independent assessment are saying about the security and safety of Pakistan nuclear weapons program. Beca because if the Americans were to take these assessments very seriously, which I think they should, uh, then mm. there is very little ground for them to be complaining about Pakistan's nuclear weapons being one of the most dangerous in the world. So it serves the interests of those who are willing to uh, still accuse Pakistan of being the most dangerous uh, place on earth. And the only uh, reference that where we saw uh, was uh, South Asia being the most dangerous uh, place in the world was by President Clinton when he, at the time of uh, the 1998 test, uh, rival test which, uh, which first second round of tests conducted by India and Pakistan responding to that. He had in the wake of those tests had described South Asia being the most uh, uh, dangerous place on earth. And I think if Pakistan has to be compared with India, not only Pakistan's safety and security record is much better, but Pakistan has acted with a lot of restraint, with a lot of responsibility, and Pakistan has an outstanding record of managing its nuclear capability so well that it does not pose any kind of a threat to, uh, to, to any, any country, country in the world. Right, your point is well taken, Dr. Rifat Hussain. Um, Mr. Ijaz Malik, very briefly, what uh, exactly Pakistani authorities need to do uh, from onwards after such type of positive statements uh, that depict the damage control from the U.S. authorities? 
I, I think we should uh, uh, engage uh, uh, their uh, uh, think tanks. We should uh, avail every opportunity to voice our concern and reassure uh, uh, not only America, but the entire world that we being a nuclear uh, uh, state, we are a very responsible state and uh, we have a very elaborate command and control system and regardless of our uh, political you know polarization uh, the there is a very solid uh, cohesive uh, you know uh, uh, arrangement in place and all segment of our political elite and uh, establishment uh, this is their concern to ensure the safety and security of pakistan and nuclear assets Right, uh, Air, Vice, uh, Air Vice Marshal retired Mr. Ijaz Malik joining us on Skype from Washington. Senior analyst, thank you very much for your time for being on Views on News. Really appreciate that. And we were also honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Nasir Ali Khan, former ambassador. Thank you very much for your time also. And Dr. Rifat Hussain, strategic analyst, thank you very much for your time for thank being you on so Views much. on News. It was really an enlightening discussion. We'd love to discuss this topic in the future further as well. Let me uh, put in uh, a quick historical facts. The US was the first uh, country uh, to test a nuclear bomb uh, that was back in July in 1945 and right away in August 1945 it dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and then uh, we saw the USSR testing its first nuclear bomb in 1949, the UK in 1952, France in 1960, China in 1964, India in 1974, Pakistan in 1998 and North Korea in 2006. Now, there have been a lot of mishaps and in incidents regarding the safety and the security of a nuclear arsenal uh, in other countries of the world. Never it had been witnessed in Pakistan. Since Pakistan has a robust control and command system, which has also been uh, verified by the Nuclear Threat Initiative, and the figures regarding that one are also available, with an improved ranking to have the safety and the security of the arrangements of the nuclear weapons, Pakistan has uh, gained 25 points, and that is a phenomenal. And that happens to be the second largest improvement when it comes to the safety and the security of the nuclear arsenal in Pakistan. With that note, we come to the end of today's Views on News. Until the next episode, take good care of yourselves.